Welcome to the conversation. I am Carrie Ann and I will be your host in this first segment of the show. Now with me, instead of a Jared, I have the lovely Athena, who is one of our Tomorrow Science hosts. I also have with me Mike, who is our rocket specialist, and a data behind us who is going to be producing the show. Happy birthday, Mom. Oh, happy, happy birthday, birthday Mom. <laughs> now, uh, today in news, we have Athena. Exoplanet Hunter Tess arrives in Florida. Awesome, Mike. The National Space Council has met for the second time. Interesting. And then for our main topic, Jared will be back, and he's going to be interviewing one of all of our heroes, really, the Pluto evangelist, Dr. Alan Stern. Then in our third segment, we're going to look back at your questions and comments about last week's show. But this is Tomorrow Orbit 11.08. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Now I want to make sure I give a huge thank you to the citizens who support us here on the Tomorrow Show. These are the Escape Velocity citizens. These people have given us $10 or more for, per episode on Patreon or $30 a month on Makersupport.com. They, of course, get their name in the show, big and bold, so you can read it. They get early access to view only copies of the show rundown, so you can see what we're going to talk about before we even talk about it. And honestly, so much more. If you are also interested in becoming a citizen of Tomorrow, head on over to makersupport.com slash T-M-R-O. Now, Mike, uh, I feel like there was like a launch or something that happened this last week, which I know I say every week, but, uh, you know, that's so great that I get to say it every single week. So why don't you start us off with launches? What, uh, what did we miss in last week? Sure. Yeah, and it's almost kind of disappointing because there was only one launch this week, although it was a really cool one, so <laughs> I'm not that disappointed. But uh, what we're talking about, the only launch that happened this week um, actually occurred after several day, uh, days of delays for it, but finally took off on Thursday. And we're talking, of course, about the Falcon 9 rocket that uh, delivered a Spanish radar imaging satellite and also two demo satellites for SpaceX's uh, proposed constellation of star, uh, Starlink satellites to provide global <laughs> broadband access so ah this was a cool launch very cool six five four three two one Night launches, of course, are always beautiful, and this particular launch occurred on Thursday, February 22nd at 1417 Coordinated Universal Time from Space Launch Complex 4 East at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And the rocket was traveling south by southwest from Vandenberg to place the payloads into a polar sun-synchronous orbit. Now, the Falcon 9 first stage actually is launching for the second time. It previously flew the Taiwanese Formosat 5 Earth Observation Mission, uh, also from the same place, from California in August of last year. Now, the primary payload was the Spanish radar imaging satellite known as PACE, or it's, it's Spanish for peace. Um, and it's owned by a company called HIDASAT, which oversees Spain's government satellite programs. And it's going to collect radar imagery for Spain's military, their allies, and commercial companies. Um, the Falcon 9 also successfully de delivered a, a pause into a 514-kilometer kilometer polar orbit that was tilted about 97.4 degrees to the equator. Now, despite the Falcon 9 first stage being a flight-proven booster, SpaceX did not attempt a landing of the first stage, and I can only assume it has to do with the upcoming Block 5 version of the Falcon 9 that will be the primary workhorse of SpaceX's fleet without plans of doing any of the older Block versions. Now, uh, they were able to deploy the uh, uh, pause satellite successfully, and riding along with them were two demo satellites for the Star 
Starlink constellation. And uh, they were named Microsat 2A and Microsat 2B, nicknamed Tintin A and Tintin B. And they actually are using their own propulsion to uh, uh, take themselves higher than that 500 kilometer orbit to roughly 1,125 kilometers in altitude once the controllers finish an initial post launch checkout of the spacecraft. Now, um, after they're doing uh, all the different tests with that and making sure that the ground stations work, um, they hopefully will be able to deploy around 4,425 of these satellites broadcasting in Ku and Ka band frequencies. And there's also a really interesting proposal that they have now for an additional 7,000 satellites that would be flying in a really low orbit broadcasting in the V band frequencies. So that would make, if this is realized, that would make Starlink the biggest satellite fleet in operation. Um, now, despite the lack of the booster landing, there was another type of recovery attempt on this mission. Uh, SpaceX has been working on being able to recover the payload fairings, which are about $5 million per launch, and have installed cold gas thrusters and parachutes to aid in their slowdown and recovery. SpaceX also outfitted a boat with a large net to catch the payload fairings. The boat is called Mr. Steven, and it attempted to catch one of the fairings, although it came really, really close. The fairing landed about a few hundred meters away, and Elon Musk said that they should be able to catch it with slightly bigger parachutes to slow down the descent. Now, uh, the next Falcon 9 launch is scheduled for early Sunday from Cape Canaveral that is also carrying another Spanish-owned satellite, Hispasat 30W-6, a communications satellite. So looking forward to that and uh, some other launches next week as well. Awesome. That's uh, that's very, very cool. Um, you know, I just lost it in the chat room. Where did it go? <laughs> um, Wang got uh, from the Twitch channel says, uh, which which uh, did they play Bowie, though? Uh, I thought it said which Bowie sandwich <laughs> song do they play, uh, but still the thought uh, the thought is still the same. Um, uh, wouldn't that be great if uh, that was just the theme now? Like whatever whatever SpaceX ever launches on a demo mission, it, it must play a Bowie song. Uh, I think would be hilarious. Uh, Please, I hope they do that. Right. Uh, I'm guessing that's that's not something. I feel like that that was something you would have added to the story if that was a thing. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and if there was a song playing, they didn't they didn't broadcast it over the uh, the live webcast. So <laughs> that's that's Someone fair. Was probably listening to a Bowie song at SpaceX while this was happening. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, Yip Swank. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. In the chat room says licensing nightmare. Uh, yeah, I can only imagine. Uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, demo launches are demo launches, and I think uh, I think that's really cool. I feel like there was a couple of new things going on there, and. And, uh, but, you know, main mission is, is the mission. And somebody else in the chat room, I, again, I didn't mark it, uh, said that it's pronounced pa as opposed to pause. Ah. Oh. Okay. Just that we're, we're all on the same page there. Perfect. Pa. So, Miss Athena. I've heard like four oh, different fine. pronunciations of yeah. it, so I still don't know right. who to believe. I've heard it both ways. Says, says, <laughs> yeah. hey, my Mexican friend says it's pause, so. That's funny. Yeah. All right. Know. Or pause, pez, like the candy. Oh, there still you love go. Those okay. A little bit of each. According <laughs> to the customer, it's puff. Puff. According to the customer, it's puff. puff. Spanish. Well, and that's what it is. Does puff. Sound my, like my, my apologies. Uh, <laughs> you don't say, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Miss Athena, uh, you know, you didn't have to do a planetary uh, story just because you're sort of standing in for Jared, but I very much appreciate that this is also your area that you like to speak about. So, uh, tell me a little bit more about Tess. What is it? What's going on? All the things. Yeah, so um, TESS is the next exoplanet hunting uh, satellite that's mm -hmm. actually going to be uh, launched soon. It's going to be in April. And uh, just arrived to Kennedy Space Center for its final checkouts and integration um, to get onto the Falcon 9 uh, launch vehicle. Um, it's known as the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, mm -hmm. better known as TESS. Uh, it's due for launch in April from Complex 40 Launch Pad, uh, with the option of being reassigned to Launch Pad 39A. Uh, right now, they're looking at April 16th for a potential launch date, launch date, but they're currently waiting for approval first from the U.S. Air Force's Eastern Range. Um, it's currently undergoing preparations for launch in the payload hazardous sur um, service facility at Kennedy Space Center. This is the same clean room where Cassini, New Horizons, Mars rovers, and so many other missions um, have actually been prepped for before launch. Um, 
uh, this will be the first NASA science mission to launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. So that's really, really exciting. Uh, TESS will be launched into orbit about 250,000 kilometers from Earth. And it's going to deploy the second stage on the Falcon 9, and then the spacecraft's thrusters will boost it into its furthest arc of its orbit, intercepting the moon's orbit, where it's then going to pick up the lunar gravity to slingshot it into its designated orbit. I just think that's the coolest thing ever. Um, where it's then going to orbit Earth around once every two weeks uh, at a maximum orbital distance at about 376,000 kilometers from Earth. So because of this specific maneuver required, um, to put it into proper orbit, the launch will be very much based around the position of the moon. So there is a big series of uh, potential launch dates. Mm -hmm. Now, TESS is going to be a two-year mission, tracking over 200,000 stars and measuring periodic dips in light, which indicates that there may be a planet orbiting that star. Uh, and this is better known as exoplanets that we've been searching for. Uh, and it's going to make these measurements thanks to its four wide-field astronomical cameras. And when the satellite nears perigee, which is the closest point to Earth in its orbit, which is normally three times farther than the geostationary belt, TESS will send science data collected through a Ka band antenna back to Earth, which is then when we can analyze and, and find out if, whether or not we actually were able to pick up any exoplanets. Mm. TESS will be working alongside data collected from the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to be due for launch in 2019, making follow-up observations collected by James Webb. So it's really great that these two are going to be working together. And then following in the pattern of the Kepler mission, TESS will be uh, scanning the sky for exoplanet signatures. Um, and it has the goal of actually finding rocky exoplanets close to Earth's size in the habitable zone of a star. Uh, so that was really is, again, the hopes of finding life and extraterrestrial, some type of life, even if it's just like microbial. Um, over the next few weeks, TESS engineers will be running performance tests in addition to the vibration, acoustic, and thermal tests done over the past year. So extending the solar panels, uh, pre-stowing pre in them, uh, it's going to fuel the spacecraft around 45 kil kilograms of hydrazine fuel for its main engine and its, its control uh, thrusters. Then it's going to nicely encapsulate inside the Falcon 9 payload, where it's going to be transported to the SpaceX rocket hangar at Pad 40 to then be, you know, attached to the two-stage launcher, and then it's going to be launched. So I'm super excited for that. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of amazing data that's going to come out of this. I'm also just really excited to see, once it's put into orbit, um, the actual extension of the solar panels, mm -hmm. uh, and then see its thrusters really put it into its, its uh, actual orbit. But I just think it's so cool how, how we, we put satellites and, and spacecraft in orbit where it like picks up gravity from either the moon or, or another uh, passing by planet like Juno with the, the Jupiter mission. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll actually pick up its gravity and they'll put it in its trajectory. So this is going to be really exciting. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, colleagues of mine back in the Hayden Planetarium that are doing research on exoplanets. Nice. So they're going to be collecting a lot of this data to hopefully find uh, you know, other solar uh, planetary systems out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, you know, Like Trappist-1. The uh, uh, gravitational cool. assist always reminds me of uh, a, a ride at Walt Disney World at Epcot Center um, where you are supposed to be on the space mission and you do, like, a, the gravitational assist. So you were saying then, like, that's Ooh. all I can think of was, like, oh, yeah, and then you kind of slingshot around here and then you go over there and then you end up on Mars and bad things happen and it's <laughs> terrible. Uh, but you live, so it's okay. Uh, Mike, you were going to say something? I'm so sorry. I cut you off. Something else really interesting about this is SpaceX just recently got certified to be able to launch uh, NASA science missions. So I think oh. that that's really cool that this has all come together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also, I really like the the conjunction of uh, TESS and James Webb Telescope as well. I didn't actually realize that they were going to be sort of speaking to each other and working uh, kind of on the same sort of thing. So that's... That's also really neat. Yeah. Um, space yeah. is like one big happy family, you guys. It is. Big <laughs> collaboration. Definitely a big international collaboration. Exactly. Oh, that's the perfect way, segue. So speaking of collaboration, Mr. Mike, you were talking about the National Space Council meeting for the second time. Yeah. Um, I assume that went perfectly. Right, we we decided everything, <laughs> and it's it's all good now, well, right? Actually, <laughs> actually, I'm I'm pretty excited about the stuff that was talked about at this meeting. I mean, it's kind of boring red tape type stuff, but the the goals that they are wanting to do is really exciting. And and what I'm talking about is is they met at, at Kennedy Space Center on Wednesday of this week, and most of the recommendations that they would come up with, they came up with four, all have to do with regulations and being able to speed up the process of being able to get licensing and uh, even uh, uh, export control as well. So they're even talking about revising ITAR, which is really exciting, and trying to speed up all of these things that slow down so much development of uh, new commercial space companies. So let's just jump right into this. The first recommendation that the National Space Council had was that the Secretary of Transportation should work to transform the launch and 
reentry licensing regime. The Department of Transportation would require a single license for all types of launch and reentry vehicle operations and would hopefully be able to transform uh, all of those uh, regulatory processes from one uh, just just one set of requirements uh, to have some sort of performance based licensing. Now, uh, here's a good example. Um, you, if there's ever a mission that needs to be transferred, you can't transfer a rocket from one launch site to another. If a company receives its launch, uh, its license to launch from, say, the Kennedy Space Center and wants to move their mission to California, or even just a few miles away from Cape Canaveral at one of the Air Force stations, that same company has to complete the entire licensing process all over again. Mm. So they're hoping that that needs to be completed by March 1st of 2019. The second recommendation is that the Secretary of Commerce should consolidate all its different space commerce responsibilities, other than launch and reentry, uh, into the Secretary of, into the Office of the Secretary of Commerce that would be responsible for all commercial space regulatory functions. For example, what they're wanting to do is get together with the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the FCC, the Federal Communications Communi uh, Commission, and NASA to be able to streamline existing commercial uh, remote sensing and communication operations so that they will be able to speed up and have kind of like a one-stop shopping for all of the different licensings that need to go into uh, creating a permit for, uh, for satellites, which can take up to five years. Um, and they're hoping to get that done by this summer, July 1st of 2018. Now, the third recommendation was to uh, uh, work together with the National Telecommunication and Information Administration uh, to coordinate with the FCC to help protect and maintain all the different radio frequency spectrums necessary for all the different space commercial activities. And the final recommendation, which is what I'm most excited about, is that the executive secretary of the National Space Council, in, in coordination with all the different members and all the new um, uh, 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 basically consultants that have been uh, added onto this are wanting to review all of the different export licensing regulations to help commercial space activity. And the main point of conversation during this meeting was how this would affect our cooperation or lack thereof with China and how we could be able to cooperate with them and have a lot more manageable technology transfer laws. You know, still protect, you know, important things, but get rid of a lot of the stuff that like China already has. So especially considering China's lunar ambitions and their partnership with Russia and the European Space Agency to accomplish their goals, if NASA, our partners, and China all works together on all of our shared goals, we could all of those could be realized so much faster. So that's what I'm most excited about, that these people that in the past were, were the same people that were that were passing laws to, to hinder NASA from cooperating with China are now changing their mind and being a lot more open to the possibilities of cooperating with them. So that really excites me because I want to see all of humanity go on this journey together. So uh, that last one, that last recommendation about the ITAR control should be, uh, they want that to be completed by January 1st of 2019. So wow, quick. yeah, I'm excited about these changes and to see what uh, might actually get passed in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's funny, uh, not that people weren't listening because I know that that you were, uh, but there's a number of, of comments in the chat room uh, talking about the helmet. Uh, Vib3S from YouTube says, I need that helmet. Uh, Andy Law, also from YouTube, says, that is a great pick. Uh, Donald Thrump uh, from YouTube says, damn, that helmet looks good. And <laughs> Neb Hittums, also again from YouTube, says, iconic helmet. Uh, <laughs> like, everyone was so focused. Uh, it was a great picture. I also sort of love uh, that, like, nobody was taller than any of the astronauts in that picture. Uh, if anyone happened to notice that, because astronauts are not really known for being very tall people. Uh, most of them are more like this. Uh, I actually have a step. <laughs> but every, like nobody was taller than the astronauts there, so uh, I, I, I particularly also like that, that picture. That was kind of funny. That was so cool. I want that helmet. <laughs> right? Oh, goodness. Um, so, Miss Athena. Uh, yes. As I have, I also do this with Jared as well. Uh, look at the title of your next story. Try to figure out what it's about, and I have no clue. Uh, so it's, it, this says <laughs> Mars 2020 will take a visitor home. Uh, now you're not talking about any sort of, you know, billionaire person with maybe a launch. A, you know, a launch company. Under no, no, okay. definitely not. I just want to make sure. Just want to make no, sure. No, definitely Perfect. not. Yeah. And, uh, so then, what are we speaking about? A rock. So oh, okay, good. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, we're totally good. It's literally a rock. So um, scientists are actually bringing um, a Mars meteorite back to the surface of Mars. Interesting. Um, yeah. So it literally like crash landed uh, here on Earth, and we determined that it was from Mars. So. 
It's going to be on the Mars 2020 rover, which will be touching the Martian surface to search for evidence of past microbial life. Uh, and it's going to be bringing this exactly meteorite that you're seeing right now back with it. It's called the Say Ala Amir, uh, also known as SAU008, um, which is a meteorite. Um, it actually landed in Oman, which is uh, just south of Saudi Arabia. And uh, after lots of analyses, we realized it came from Mars. So scientists are putting this sample um, on the 2020 rover specifically because of uh, to calibrate a laser scanner instrument that is equipped on the rover's ar uh, robotic arm. It's known as Sherlock, which stands for Scanning Habitable Environments with uh, Raymond or Ramen. I I'd like to say Raymond because it sounds like ramen noodles. Okay, exactly. anyway, Ramen and luminance uh, for organics and chemicals. So this instrument is actually going, it's a, it uses a spectrometer and a laser camera to search for organics and minerals that may have been altered due to an encounter with water. So hence possibly showing signs of microbial life that might have actually existed once on the Martian surface. Sherlock does this by taking samples and putting them under visible near-infrared and near-ultraviolet light, where it then measures and analyzes how the photons from the light in the different wavelengths respond to the collected samples, and from there, scientists are able to determine what elements are pretty much present on this rock or on the surface of Mars. Uh, and with the, Florence, uh, the fluorescence spectroscopy instrument, Ultraviolet lasers are used to excite electrons in carbon-based compounds, and if there's a presence of life on these samples, this experiment will cause the chemicals to glow, and this is known as a biosignature. Um, so again, Sherlock uh, is going to be using uh, also, it's going to be photographing the Mars rocks that it studies, which is also going to allow for a science team to map the chemical signatures that it finds across the surface of Mars. And this is going to be the first instrument that uses uh, Raman and fluorescence spectroscopy on Mars. Uh, so here's actually an image of the oxygen plasma cleaner. Uh, so this is a, a device that is being used to actually clean off the surface of the Martian meteorite, clearing it of all organics that are, are found on the outside of the surface before we send it back to Mars. Uh, the specific meteorite was chosen because of its, it has like really rough features to it. And it was actually able to be sliced without flaking and it's strong enough to survive like the high vibrations during takeoff and also space flight and then eventually landing and, and you know, the Mars rover like rolling around on, on, <laughs> on the surface. <laughs> uh, so no, this, is, um, this isn't the first time, though, that a Martian meteorite actually went back to Mars. In 1999, aboard the Mars Global Surveyor, Zagami, a meteorite uh, retrieved from Nigeria in 1962, went back to Mars, uh, but it never actually went on the surface. So this is actually in orbit right now around the planet still to this day. Um, so the SAU-008 meteorite, which is going to be going on the Mars 2020 rover, will be the first meteorite to actually touch uh, the surface of Mars uh, since it actually had come from Mars and crash landed on our planet. Lastly, the Mars 2020 rover will have on board a lot of advanced materials for testing exposure to radiation and weather on Mars. And if these materials survive and react really well to these conditions, then NASA will be able to turn them into manufacturing spacesuits, gloves, and helmets for future astronaut missions. So this is going to be really, really cool. Um, I think that's like the most exciting component. I was trying to do a lot of research to find out what the advanced materials were, but mm -hmm. it's kind of hard for me to, I actually ended up, I ended up not finding anything. I don't know <laughs> if they're just not releasing what type of materials. Right. Um, but yeah, but if we definitely have materials on this Mars rover and it survives the conditions, then yo, like that'll be my first outfit when I go to Mars. <laughs> 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 I think it'd be great. That's so, so awesome. Uh, <laughs> I, I, yes. All I can think of though with this story is that the rover is going to plop down and just be like, hey Mars, you dropped this. Right, yeah. Plop the rock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was actually worried for a little bit that go. when it came through our atmosphere, the very first picture of it, uh, the scientist was wearing a purple glove and it was reflecting a lot of the purple on the meteorite itself. And I was like, wait, is it, is it purple? Like, I, I got a little concerned that, like, our atmosphere changed the color so much of it that when it goes back, it's going to be, like, its friends won't like it anymore. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's going to be a Why weird, you like, purple? you're not you from here. Man, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I think it went through the ox plasma cleaner. Right. Because they wanted to just eliminate all other organisms that it, it actually was put on it from Earth. Being totally, Earth. totally, totally. Uh, the other thing that uh, I did want to point out really quickly is that Sherlock clearly is a backronym, uh, as TARS so succinctly uh, uh, states for us, backronym, uh, bureaucracy, administrative, creating, creation, knowing, retroactively, obviously naming your mission, uh, which is in itself obviously a backronym. Uh, backronym just being that, you know, they wanted to call it something cool. They came up with Sherlock and then they like made all of the things <laughs> I love fit it. Sherlock. Uh, you know, uh, Miss Athena hasn't been with us very long, is not familiar with backronym. And so now we are explaining it for everybody. That's like uh, really cool. Yeah, as soon as you said that. Sherlock, I was like, that's a backronym. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Right? Totally.
totally, that's totally, so good. totally. <laughs> oh, that's that's awesome. Um, all right, so uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a little bit of a calendar break. Uh, I think there's more than one of those this week, and uh, you're gonna get to see uh, again what some of the things that Mike will be talking about next week. And when we come back, Jared will be having a fantastic interview with one Dr. Alan Stern. Stay with us. There's more tomorrow coming right up. Look into her face, determination in her eyes She won't give up a quit or fall for little fashion lies Filled on some expectation, this girl's a fascination And nothing in her way will keep her from her destination Cause she's firewalking, she's firewalking When it's hot, she keeps on moving And welcome back to the main part of today's Tomorrow episode. Now, before we get started with it, we want to give a huge shout out to our Escape Velocity citizens. These folks give us $10 or more per episode on Patreon or $30 a month or more on Makersupport.com. And we also want to give a huge shout out to our Orbital citizens as well. These folks give us $5 or more per episode on Patreon or $15 a month or more on Maker Support, And they get a whole host of goodies uh, that you can look at and you can see on either patreon.com slash tmro or makersupport.com slash tmro. So go over, consider every little bit helps us, and you are awesome because you help make this show possible. And speaking of this show today, I'm very excited because we have an incredible guest today. We're going to talk about some really cool stuff. I've got Dr. Alan Stern, the principal investigator of the New Horizons mission, who has, your career has just been incredible with the amount of work that you've done. Uh, and we're very glad to have you on here today, Dr. Stern. Jared, it's awesome to be here. I'm really looking forward to spending the time. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so uh, to just go right off of the bat, uh, I definitely want to ask, because um, we all have that moment that sort of uh, sparks our curiosity of space and, and sets us off on this path uh, that we end up taking uh, into the space industry. And I got to ask, what was that first experience that kindled your interest in space? You know, I was a little kid, a little kid growing up uh, during Apollo and uh, just watching that and Star Trek and movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey, like just about everybody else <laughs> my age, want to grow up and be an astronaut and fly in space. What could be better? <clears throat> Excellent. Well, um, uh, and, and you continued on that. You went to college for both aerospace engineering and planetary science, um, which is quite an interesting combo with those two together. Um, and when you were in college, the Voyager mission, the twin Voyager probes, were occurring at that time. Um, and they were kind of rewriting some of the books that you may have been reading at that time. So what was that experience like, sort of being, uh, being, on, being in college while some of these things are being rewritten? Right. Well, that was an amazing experience. And actually, NASA and the Jet Propulsion Lab, I remember during the Jupiter encounter with uh, Voyager 1, uh, that they were broadcasting live images as they were being downlinked from the spacecraft and uh, high resolution images of the Galilean satellites like Io and Europa. And then the crazy meteorology of Jupiter coming on the screen. And I was an aerospace engineering student learning about orbital mechanics. And it just revolutionized my view of how interesting the planets could be. And uh, uh, kind of set me on a path towards eventually, 10 years later, uh, doing a doctorate in astrophysics and planetary science. Nice. So, um, so you were also a principal investigator on a couple payloads for the space shuttle um, as well. So what, uh, what did those payloads entail flying on shuttle? Well, I, I did two. One was called CHAMP and one was called um, SWISS. And those are acronyms. Uh, and they both were ultraviolet and visible imagers to study comets, in particular Comet Hale-Bopp uh, and, uh, and Comet Halley. And uh, they flew on a total of uh, four space shuttle missions, flying in the cockpit, really downstairs as a mid-deck locker experiment that looked out through an ultraviolet window and was operated by one of the mission specialist crew 
crew members on each flight. And we got great data. Nice. Um, now, I want to sort of go into sort of the, uh, the meat and potatoes of the, the work that you've done um, so far. And in order to do that, we've got to sort of backtrack a little bit uh, to the late 80s with what's now known as the Pluto Underground. Um, and that's when that was formed. And what was, what was the Pluto Underground all about? And what was your role in making the Pluto Underground? Well, let me backtrack even further. Uh, <laughs> in, after, after Viking... Uh, which was the first pair of Mars landers uh, ever done. Na NASA did that. And uh, after Viking, uh, there was a long hiatus in Mars exploration. And a bunch of college students and graduate students formed an organization in the early 80s called the Mars Underground. And they became very successful in putting NASA back on the road to having an exciting program of robotic Mars exploration. They really changed the game. And now it was the end of the 80s, 1988, 89, and uh, I was in graduate school, and <laughs> we got this brilliant idea that since Voyager wasn't going any further than Neptune, wasn't going to Pluto, and the Pluto science was just exploding from ground-based telescopes, that we ought to form a group to get a mission to Pluto. And we called it, after the Mars Underground, we called it the Pluto Underground. <laughs> and uh, I helped form it. And I was a really active member in it. And uh, that's really the genesis, the catalyst of what ultimately became New Horizons more than another 10 years later in 2001. Yeah, and I just kind of want to uh, let our audience know, which is that uh, Voyager 1 actually could have gone on to Pluto. Um, but they, if I remember correctly, they did a flyby of Titan um, at Saturn instead. Um, and was that kind of a really big motivator for you guys? Or was it overall just seeing the enthusiasm for Mars exploration that allowed you to sort of want to get that same enthusiasm for exploring Pluto? It was more the latter, you know. The, the, the people involved were a bunch of uh, young scientists. Um, we called ourselves the Plutophiles. Uh, because we were all experts and lovers <laughs> in the study of this distant little world that wasn't getting any any love, any attention um, from a spacecraft mission. And, uh, you know, we were um, uh, uh, energetic enough to think that if, if uh, we just kept increasing our ranks and making a better and better story, well, who wouldn't want to go to Pluto? Of course, it took 12 years to convince the system to spend the money, but it worked. So what was, uh, what was those 12 years like when you were trying to convince people um, to do that mission? Was it, was it, I mean, 12 years, that sounds like a really long time in order to stick with sort of the, the same idea. You guys just really toughed it out. It, it was tough, and it took a lot of persistence. Actually, what happened right in 1989 was that I got uh, kind of put forward by the group to go up to NASA headquarters and talk to the guy that ran planetary science at the time, Jeff Briggs, and pitch him with the idea of, why don't you do a study at least of how we do a mission to Pluto? And Jeff, bless his heart, he loved that, and he initiated a study almost right away. <clears throat> I became one of the study scientists, and, uh, and that study worked out very well in 1990. NASA had a press conference and said, this is how you do a mission to Pluto, and uh, NASA formed a working group to study it in more detail. They made me the chairman of the working group, um, but by 1991, um, that all got canceled in favor of a different approach, and it was demoralizing, and we went off on a second approach called um, uh, Mariner Mark II to Pluto. But within less than a year, that got canceled, and we started on a third approach called Pluto Fast Flyby, and even that didn't make it, and then there were was Pluto Express and Pluto Kuiper Express, and it, it's a long, involved story, and a lot of people had to really stick with it to make it work. If we had ever given up the, you know, the desire, it would have died then and there, and no one would ever know what Pluto looks like or any of the great science that turned out. Um, and it did take a dozen years, and it took just a lot of gumption and, frankly, a lot of work and a lot of persistence. And uh, I've got a book that's coming out with David Grinspoon called Chasing New Horizons. It's coming out May 1st, but you can order it now online. And I'll tell you what, it tells the whole story, the pretty parts and the ugly parts, the exciting parts and the demoralizing parts, and, of course, uh, also what we learned when we got to Pluto. 
Excellent, yeah. As, uh, as I've often heard said, uh, uh, engineering is very rarely uh, a parade of victories uh, as it comes along um, with it. So kind of to talk a little bit about mission design and things, uh, we do have a really good question from our, uh, our chat room from Jason519, which the question is, do you think there would be value in mass-produced modular research probes, or should we stick to missions that are built for purpose? I think uh, it's not an either or question that both um, have appropriate applications. For example, we wouldn't mass produce Pluto orbiters for the next step in Pluto exploration, but we would mass produce CubeSats to study the Earth's magnetosphere, to do uh, environmental surveillance of our planet, to understand how it's changing. There are plenty of applications in planetary science and astrophysics as well for mass produced CubeSats in lunar exploration. But you're also going to need those specialized missions like a Mars sample return or a Uranus or Neptune orbiter or the next mission to the Kuiper belt that'll be one-offs or maybe onesie twosies where you'd send a pair like Voyager. Excellent. Yeah, so sort of a, a nice balance between the two kind of helps, uh, helps everybody out with that. Um, so to talk a little bit about the design process, um, once New Horizons was approved, uh, what were some of the things that you had to do with that design process? Well, it was an involved, involved process, and ultimately, you know, almost 2,500 people ended up working on New Horizons to design the spacecraft, build and test it, uh, to fly it, to build the rocket, design and test that, the nuclear power supply, all the seven scientific instruments. And so it was a very involved process. And, you know, we had a lot of challenges. One of them was that uh, NASA wanted to do New Horizons on about – one-fifth, 20%, the cost of Voyager. And that required making some breakthroughs. Now, a lot of people thought it was kind of a fool's errand, that you couldn't do it, that it cost what it cost. And if NASA only had 20% of the money, you'd get started and you'd find out at some point you couldn't make the case close and actually do the project on that small of a budget. Uh, but we managed to pull it off. And I give a lot of credit to the engineers and the scientists at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, Southwest Research Institute, all of our university partners who uh, just wouldn't quit. We just kept thinking of new innovations until we found a way to do this. So to talk a little bit um, about assembling a team, because Pluto was kind of, I mean, there was data about Pluto, but there wasn't really a lot of data um, when, you're, when you're in this process. So how do you assemble a, a top-notch science team for a relatively unknown place? What are, what are some of the things that you're looking at studying, and how do you get those people to do that? Yeah, well, fortunately, there was already a science definition team which many of us had served on, chaired by Jonathan Lenine, who's now at Cornell. Back then, he was at the University of Arizona. Uh, and uh, uh, the SDT, as it's called, had laid out the scientific objectives for a first mission to Pluto, to map the geology of Pluto and its big moon, Charon, to map their surface composition, study their atmosphere, Pluto's atmosphere in certain ways, et cetera. And so we knew what objectives we had, and that sort of told us what instruments we wanted to fly. And then we found the best people in the world for either those kinds of data analysis or for building those instruments. And uh, uh, a lot of them were Voyager veterans, people who've been graduate students or even undergraduates um, on Voyager. In fact, my author, in you know, my co-author in Chasing New Horizons, Dave Grinspoon, himself was a, gra a grad student on Voyager in the uh, Neptune flyby. And uh, a lot of the members of the New Horizons science team that are now senior scientists um, were cutting their teeth on Voyager. And uh, NASA announced that it would have a competition and um, uh, invite teams to propose uh, right just a week before Christmas in the year 2000. And uh, we would have proposals due in March of 2001, which was a really short fuse. So I spent that Christmas, New Year's vacation on the phone, dialing up all the people that I thought we needed to form that team and uh, the people that you see on the New Horizons team, ex except for those that we brought on in recent years, um, all the vets from the original days were people that got phone calls during that short period of about 10 days and said, you ready to roll up your sleeves, rock and roll, and go win this proposal? 
Yeah. So uh, from our YouTube uh, channel, we have A underscore D, who's got a really good question, uh, which is, what are some of the, the designs that allowed New Horizons to work on a 20% <clears throat> budget compared to Voyager? How did you guys save that much? Well, I'll give you three quick examples. First thing we did is we said, if we make it reliable enough of a spacecraft, if we make it completely redundant inside, we don't need to fly two of them like Voyager did. And that saves a lot right there. You don't need a second rocket. You don't need a second spacecraft. You don't need a second mission control team. Um, it's riskier, but we took that chance and it worked out. Um, we downsized the telecommunication system. So we have bit rates that are 10 times slower than 1970s Voyager. But it saved us an enormous amount of money, not just because we had a smaller antenna and lower power transmitters, but it let us get away with only one instead of two nuclear power supplies. And those babies are expensive. <laughs> Third thing we did was um, we put a lot of software on the spacecraft to let it take care of itself in flight. It's called an autonomy system. And therefore, we didn't have to babysit with round the clock mission control for 10 years from the launch in 06 to the flyby in 2015. Instead, we could get away with a much smaller mission control staff and get rid of a lot of salaries multiplied over 10 years. And that was another enormous savings. And I'll tell you, almost all spacecraft now include these autonomy systems and take care of themselves the way that we pioneered. Yeah, and another uh, question from Lance in our chat room, which is what was the single toughest thing to solve to get New Horizons actually on the books and, and heading out to Pluto? What was the single toughest thing? The single toughest thing was getting the funding, no question. Um, you know, raising the better part of a billion dollars takes the consensus of a lot of people, the National Academy of Sciences, NASA. You have to line up a lot of Clydesdales to make that work. Um, I would say almost as tough was getting nuclear launch approval in only four years because it involves 42 state and federal agencies. That's... Uh, that's a lot of moving parts, and it had never been done before. You know, it typically took eight to 10 years for other missions to do it, and we just really had to uh, uh, find a new way. And if it hadn't been for our project manager, Glenn Fountain, who made that happen, New Horizons would have never been launched. So um, speaking of that launch that happened on January 19th, 2006, um, you guys flew on an Atlas V in its most powerful configuration, the 551. And if that wasn't enough, you put a solid motor third stage um, on top of it as well to get some extra oomph. And you left uh, Earth at an absolute speed record for a vehicle, 16.26 uh, kilometers per second. That is absurdly fast. Um, and uh, to kind of piggyback on that with a question from our chat room from Johnny Boy, um, they're asking, uh, will New Horizons overtake the Voyager spacecraft as the most distant spacecraft? And if that happens, when is that going to happen? That's a really common question. As, as, as you said, we were the fastest spacecraft ever launched. And let me make a comparison to tell you how fast it's going. Get rid of the miles per hour, miles per second, <laughs> all that. Those are hard to comprehend. When I was a kid and Apollo missions were launching to the moon, their speed at, at the moment of, of highest speed was 25,000 miles an hour. And it took them three days to get to the moon. New Horizons did it in nine hours. <laughs> so you can see we were moving. And we're... You know, the previous mission to Jupiter took four and a half years. We did it in 13 months flat. Whew. Very fast spacecraft. However, although we launched faster than the Voyagers, the Pioneers, and any other spacecraft, the Voyagers did multiple giant planet flybys and got a speed boost at each one. And as a result, they're actually moving faster than us. So we hold the record for fastest ever launched, but they're actually slightly faster than us, and we'll never catch them. Because we didn't, we only had one giant planet fly by. So Voyager two had four. Mm -hmm. Voyager one had two, and so they're both moving a little faster. Yeah, and to kind of talk about uh, that flyby you did at Jupiter, uh, you did that in February of 2007, as you mentioned, 13 months after launch, which that's like abs that's absurd for me to think about getting from Earth to Jupiter in in just a little over a year. <laughs> um, what do you, did you guys take data while you were at Jupiter? And also, why did you use a gravity assist at Jupiter? Well, the gravity assist saved us almost four years of flight time, and that saves fuel, that gives us higher power levels at the Pluto encounter gives us better data rates, 
And most importantly, it's a reliability thing. Who wants to fly 14 years out there in the wilderness if you can get there in nine and a half? So it was important to use the Jupiter flyby to get that speed. But what it also let us do is flight test all the software and techniques and all you know the instruments to make sure that Jupiter is the only thing we passed along the way. So we used it to make sure things would work well at Pluto. We conducted over 700 scientific observations at Jupiter. We did some things that had never been done before in terms of studying Io's volcanoes, the Jovian magnetosphere. I could go on about that. So yeah, we did a lot of science. We made the cover of um, Science Magazine. You know, that's kind of the Rolling Stone for geeks. And uh, <laughs> it worked out really well. <laughs> now, uh, you're, you're cruising after Jupiter until you turn everything back on in December of 2014. That's a really long time, and we've kind of got a question from our chat room that talks a little bit, a bit about that um, from Corkspin, which they're asking, uh, how do you keep a quality team on board and engaged for the long term? Because, I mean, from February, 20, or two, February 2007 to December 2014, how do you keep your team engaged for that long of a time? Yeah, well, the spacecraft was out in the middle of nowhere, um, moving at almost, well, over a million kilometers per day. Um, but because we didn't pass anything along the way, a lot of people thought we didn't have anything to do. But in reality, we were conducting scientific observations most of the time using the instruments that um, study the heliosphere. Uh, we were planning the Pluto encounter to the most excruciating detail and planning backup plans and malfunction plans and going through mission simulations. We planned four different Pluto encounters in case we had to dodge debris to different aim points in the system. And for our little team, which in route to Pluto was only 50 belly buttons, we were busy 52 weeks a year, all year. And in fact, I can't count the number of times that either my project manager or my mission operations manager or somebody else came and said, there's just too much work here. <laughs> so it wasn't a question of boredom. It was a question of how we got everything through this small pipe. Voyager had 450 people on its team. We had 50 to do the same, essentially the same work. Of course, we had modern computers and tools that helped us. But we worked around the clock. And the prize of being the first mission to the last planet, to be the only team in our generation to do you know, to completely explore a brand new planet, a new place, was so powerful that no one wanted to leave. It was kind of Hotel California. They check in, <laughs> but they never check out. Because the reward at the other end of the line was so great. In fact, I remember people telling me, and this is in the book, we're getting near Pluto, and they said, slow down. We don't actually want to do the flyby. Because we don't, we've always had Pluto in our future. We've always had this amazing thing to look forward to. And we don't know how we're going to cope with it in our past. Think about that. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and to kind of talk as we approach that, that point uh, during the mission, um, you, you start your science early in 2015. Um, what are you guys looking for as you're coming into the, the system around Pluto? Well, the earliest few months, we weren't even quite at the same resolution that you could get back from Earth with the Hubble. So we were mainly measuring the environment around Pluto to understand the radiation environment and the ch charged particles, and also to navigate the spacecraft. We had to hit a really narrow aim point in space to get all the science right when we were at Pluto on that one day of the 14th of July, 2015. So we had an extensive navigation campaign where we take pictures of Pluto against the star fields and ship them back to Earth and analyze them so that we could determine how close the pictures were to the predicted pictures in our computers because the differences were used, Pluto was off to the left or off to the right or whatever, by this amount or that amount, told us how much to fire the engines for those homing maneuvers, of which we did three on approach. So, um, so you're, coming up, you're coming up on Pluto, you got the big flyby coming up, um, and 
a couple days beforehand, uh, sort of a little, a slight heart attack moment um, where Pluto goes in, or uh, New Horizons goes into safe mode. Um, and actually, we've got multiple people um, in our chat room that are asking about those. But Juha Rajamaki uh, is is specific. Could you tell us about the safe mode issue that occurred, um, you know, those few days before? But we had multiple people in our chat room ask about this, um, and that was a that was a really big deal, I would imagine. It was a really big deal. Um, we flew the spacecraft nine and a half years and had only very minor little hiccups along the way. And 10 days before the flyby, 10 days before July 14th, on what should have been a very quiet July 4th for our team, um, major spacecraft fireworks started going off because I got a phone call in the middle of the afternoon. We had just sent all of the 10,000 lines of code up to the spacecraft to run the flyby. And I get a call from the project manager saying, Alan, we've lost contact with the spacecraft. That's never, ever supposed to happen. And the first thing I thought of was Mars Observer. Four days out from Mars, they lost contact with that spacecraft. It had blown up. So this team swung into action, and it was like that movie Apollo 13. You know, uh, <laughs> it was our finest moment, but it was also this sleepless three-day recovery process. Because remember, everything we do with a spacecraft, it's at that time, four and a half hours away by light travel. So when we would send rescue commands up, it would take four and a half hours to get there. And then it'd take another four and a half hours to find out if it worked. So it's like playing a chess game with nine hour round trip delays between each move. Uh, but, but um, you know, the book tells that story in great detail. And we had, we had, we caused our own problem. It's something that we overlooked. You know, we got thousands of things right. This one thing did bite us. Fortunately, we recovered and got back on the timeline and didn't lose any of the closed flyby sequence that started three days later. And the results were just spectacular. But the whole recovery and why it happened and all the personalities and what it was like sleeping on desks and living on pizza for three days, uh, you can read about it. I wish we had more than just these 20, 25 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the flyby happens, and you start getting the first data coming back from it. And I imagine you're you're there as that first data is coming back, and you're quite, you could quite literally be the first set of human eyes to actually see this place in the detail that we were able to see it. Um, what was it like being in the room while that was happening? Huh. Well, for our team, uh, it was very emotional. People had worked for years and years and years for that to happen. And there were a lot of tears. There were a lot of people that were just overwhelmed emotionally, in part because it had succeeded, you know, on this one try um, with no backup. And in part, just because Pluto turned out to have such a spectacular personality as a place, you know, with these mountain ranges that soar higher than the Rockies and big canyons and glaciers and volcanoes on the surface and haze layers in the atmosphere and interesting moons. And it just, it was kind of overwhelming for a few days. And people kept saying, pinch me, is this really happening? Did this all really work? Yeah. Uh, so we've got a, a really interesting technical question that I, I kind of know the answer to, but I want to hear you talk about it um, a little bit since you're you're the man uh, for it. Uh, but from Rejinx in our YouTube channel, um, what was the data rate of New Horizons at Pluto? And if you could talk a little bit about getting the data back as well and that, that process, um, that would be great to kind of add on to that question from the chat room. Sure. Well, the data the data is sent back by radio from a dish antenna on the spacecraft and get this a 15 watt transmitter oh, not 15 geez. kilowatt <laughs> like a, you know a, a, an am or fm radio station a 15 watt transmitter and then back on the earth nasa's deep space network which is three uh antenna farms one each in australia spain and california are used to receive the signal and uh th these are big antennas they're almost a football field across and um how fast we can transmit depends on a lot of things. It depends on which antenna you're using, the bigger ones or smaller ones, how high in the sky uh, Pluto is, because the higher in the sky, the less air the radio signal has to go through. Um, it depends on whether we've turned on one transmitter or both of our transmitters and we're piping data through both, um, and a few other things. But 
Bottom line, the fastest we could transmit from Pluto was 3,000 bits per second, which is like dial-up modem speeds. So we, we could send like an image back every hour. And in fact, it took us more than a year. It took 16 months to get all the data back, all the spectra and all the images and everything else took until almost the end of 2016. But in real time around the flyby, every day, a batch of new images would land and other kinds of data. And, uh, and that's what we were using to feed out to the public to just kind of reveal Pluto for the first time, not all the details, but just the basics. Yeah, and that, and, you know, that data coming out, um, that was a, a significant cultural moment, I feel like, in the history of humanity. Um, th th I mean, the, the attention of the world um, was on you and your team and the data uh, coming in for quite some time uh, after that. And that was, uh, that was impressive. Yeah. We spent a lot of time planning for that. And we really wanted to, to be able to share it in a 21st century way with everything from Instagram and Twitter um, to um, you know, live events and do it so that people anywhere could take part in it. And, uh, and that worked. And we had the biggest public response, more newspaper front pages, more magazine articles, more website visits than NASA had ever seen, ever. And I think it just shows how much people like raw and risky exploration. When you're going to a new place and you're not sure how it's going to work out, people wanted to tune in. And they can tune in again this year. You can spend your New Year's Eve with NASA because <laughs> our next flyby is New Year's Eve and New Year's Day 2019, a billion miles beyond Pluto, when we make the first ever exploration of a Kuiper Belt object, an ancient building block of planets like Pluto, and the most distant exploration in the history of humankind. New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, We'll have it on the web. We'll have it on television. It'll be live, and uh, it's going to be spectacular science. Yeah, and to kind of uh, piggyback on that a little bit, just to combine two questions in our chat room um, before we go to a final question and then our, our last set of questions that we ask every guest. Um, Dale Kirkwood wants to know what you could tell us about that target. Um, and then uh, Vibes in our chat room is also asking about how difficult um, it will be to capture that target, which if I remember correctly, it's named 2014 MU69 uh, for now. We'll see uh, what it ends up being called a little bit later. Um, but can you tell yeah. us a little bit about it and also some of the challenges that come with it compared to, yeah. say, flying by Pluto? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, 2014 MU69 isn't really a name. It's a license plate. It's a designated. <laughs> Everything in the solar system has one of these. We'll get a better name. Trust me. So uh, uh, and we don't know much about it. What we know is it's this ancient building block and no one's ever been to anything like that. Um, it's just a dot in the distance, even with the Hubble. You know, it's not the size of the United States like Pluto is. It's the size of Chesapeake Bay. It's the size of a big county. Uh, and so it's tiny compared to Pluto. We think it's a double object, um, either orbiting one another or touching a contact binary. We know its color is red, and that's about all we know. We don't know what it's made of. Uh, we don't know how dense it is. We don't know if it has moons and how many. There's some evidence that it could, could have one moon, but we're still far away. We're still 200 plus million miles away, screaming up to it. And we really won't see it for real until New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. It is a harder target than Pluto in many respects, to answer the second question, um, in part because it's tiny and it's much fainter. It's hard to navigate to. We know a lot less about it. So the kinds of observations we're doing, they have the same objectives, but we have to um, back the observations up different ways because we don't know as many details already to focus the instruments on. And so uh, we spent a lot of time writing software loads for the spacecraft and all the seven scientific instruments to study it every way we possibly can with these, this battery of powerful cameras and spectrometers, plasma instruments, all of it. And uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to this flyby. And then after that, we're going to go looking for another flyby. Excellent. So, yeah, that was another question that I saw in our chat room was, will there be a third one? Sounds like you guys are going to give it a shot. Um, and uh, to, to sort of take our final question from the chat room, um, this one always seems very relevant, especially when you have like a spacecraft like New Horizons, which is 
at escape velocity from our solar system. It's never, it's not coming back. Um, from Space Vogel, they're asking, how long will New Horizons be able to go on and stay in contact with the Earth? And it turns out the limiting factor is the amount of power on the spacecraft to run the radios in the main computer. And uh, every year, our nuclear battery generates less wattage. And we're sure that we can operate it because it's in good health. We have plenty of fuel, um, plenty of communications capability. If nothing bad happens, uh, we should be able to operate it well into the 2030s. Uh, so a long time from now. And once we get creative, you know, um, like the Voyagers, they used to think they could run till about 2015. Now they're saying maybe 2025. Once we really put our thinking caps on, we may find ways to run it as late as 2040. Wow, yeah, that's uh, that's some longevity uh, from New Horizons, and uh, I, I really hope that you guys uh, get to get to stick with it for that long. Um, now, I'm just going to ask you sort of to close out uh, our interview. We sort of have like a standard set of questions that we ask all of our guests that come on. Uh, no right or wrong answers, just the answers uh, that that uh, you think go with the question that we're asking. Um, so the first one's related sort of the launch vehicles. So, um, you know, aerospace engineering should, you know, I think you, you think you're good for this, um, which is which one do you think is going to fly first? Uh, NASA's space launch system, SpaceX's uh, big Falcon rocket or blue origins, new Armstrong rocket. So which of those three do you think is going to fly first? I think it's a horse race. Um, <laughs> if you look at the schedule, just what people have on paper, um, it, uh, SLS, SLS and um, uh, the Blue Origin, New Armstrong, are scheduled to fly before BFR. Um, but we know the schedules slip. And, uh, and certainly, SLS isn't going to fly with people on it until years after the first flight because they're not going to put people on the first flight. And so um, the great thing is, is that if you look out into the mid 20s, you know, if you look out six years from now, seven years from now, all three of these big vehicles are going to be operational. And there's just going to be a tremendous amount of capacity online for human space exploration back to the moon, back to Mars, and I hope back to many other places. We really ought to be talking about the whole solar system. And for example, on the way to Mars, I don't mean physically on one trip on the way, but as we develop our capability, I'd like to see us with humans exploring asteroids, going to Ceres, for example, with humans. Uh, there's a great role for humans at Venus, at least in orbit, operating probes on the surface. And once we have the capability of these three launchers and the in-space vehicles that NASA's planning and SpaceX is planning, then I think we're going to see uh, really a mushroomy, if you will, um, Lots of destinations and lots of capability initially in the 20s, but more so in the 30s and 40s. And, you know, I like to say this is the best time to be alive in space exploration, because with the, the kind of commercial developments that are happening now alongside the civil developments, this is where Star Trek begins right now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, hard. I, I cannot argue against that. That is a, that is spot on. Um, our second of the four questions that we ask, uh, I feel particular, particularly relevant um, to you, which is human or robot exploration of the cosmos? Well, let me ask you a question. When you eat your meal, do you, do you want the fork or the knife? You only get to pick one. <laughs> that would make it really tough, wouldn't it? They're yeah. different tools for different purposes. And it's really hard to eat the entire meal with a knife, and it's really hard to eat the entire meal with just a fork. Um, in fact, you really need the spoon, too. And we need both humans and robots, and they serve different purposes, and they're very complementary, and it's a false dichotomy to choose between them. That's my view. Yeah, good, good one. So um, next, the third question, where should we go next? And if you want to do both human and robotic, um, go for it. So. Well, there are so many choices. You know, for humans, I think where we will go next is the moon. We need to get our sea legs back, if you will, for planetary surface operations. And then after that, Mars is the obvious destination. But as we do training flights, um, the asteroids, as I said earlier, um, might make some good intermediate destinations at greater distances, but not yet having to do atmospheric entry and all of the bioprotection that you want to do at Mars. 
And for robots, you know, what's really exciting now is more exploration of the Kuiper Belt planets, uh, return missions to Uranus and Neptune, and missions like Europa Clipper, maybe Europa Lander, or a mission to Enceladus or Titan that are exploring these ocean worlds. And we need to do all of those things. We need to figure out how to afford to do all of those things on the resources that we have. We can always argue for more resources, but what we have more control over is keeping the missions in cost so that we can do make, make progress on multiple fronts in the robotic program at the same time the human program is doing that. And I think you're going to see the rise of human commercial spaceflight. And I don't just mean tourism. I think SpaceX and others will be conducting lunar missions and conducting Mars missions of their own alongside just the same way that while governments were out exploring North America, after all, Christopher Columbus was government funded by Spain. Mm -hmm. Then you saw very quickly, you know, the, the Dutch East India Company and the Hudson Bay Company form, and they were doing their own exploration and colonization. And I think we'll see something similar in space exploration. And that's going to leverage us tremendously because we're going to have more resources than just what NASA can afford. I'm, I'm in a really exciting thing. Tell yeah, it's it, it's it, you know a, a golden age is upon us, uh, quite literally. Um, and then my final question, which is also my favorite one to ask all of our guests, why space? Oh, that's it. That's the whole question. Yeah. Why, why space? space? Yeah, why space? Ah. Why space? Because space is everything. Everything is space. Every human being lives in space because we live on a planet in space. Every species on our planet. Every other planet is in space. Every object in the universe, every particle in a particle physics laboratory, everything is in space is the universe. And it is our future. And it has such opportunity to improve the human condition and the economy and to uh, inspire people. Uh, we're always captured by the idea of humans visiting the heavens. And we're, of course, also inspired by the science. Just wait till we start building cities in space and having colonies on other worlds and in space itself. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be unbelievable. <laughs> I think that might be uh, our T-shirt quote uh, for the show uh, to wrap it up with. So thanks so much for coming on, uh, Dr. Alan Stern, the principal investigator of the New Horizons mission. Um, tell us about your book one more time before we, uh, we wrap up the interview officially. Oh, thanks for asking. Dave Grinspoon and I worked very hard on this. It's coming out May 1st, Chasing New Horizons, the whole 25-year story from the 1980s when it was just an idea and a bunch of graduate students through the Pluto flyby. Um, it's the inside story of all, all the intrigue, the political intrigue, the technical intrigue, how we did it, what went wrong, what went right, who all the heroes are, a couple of the villains. And uh, we're gonna do a book tour in May for three weeks, but you can already order this book. Um, any number of places, just Google it and um, uh, get in line because I understand the pre-order sales are already doing really well. We can't wait to have it out and it's only about T minus 60 days now. All right, and I'm, I'm gonna get on that and pre-order that too, because I'm sure it's absolutely fascinating, uh, especially with David Greenspoon writing it uh, with you there. That should be a, a great read. Incredible. Yeah, so we are gonna head to a break real quick, and when we come back from this break, comments from last week's show. So stay tuned, there's more tomorrow in just a little bit. Look into a face that to my name.
and welcome to the third segment. I am Carrie Ann, and I will be your host for this as well. Hopefully you enjoyed that uh, that fantastic interview. And uh, for sure, I want to make sure I give a huge thank you again to our citizens who support us here on the show. These people are the Escape Velocity citizens. They have given us $10 or more on Patreon or $30 or more per month on Makersupport.com. And then we have um, our, there we go, our Orbital citizens. I'm sorry, I scrolled right past them. Uh, they have $5 or more per episode on Patreon or $15 a month on Maker Sport, and we also have our suborbital citizens. They have given us $2.50 or more per episode on Patreon, or $5 or more a month on Makersupport.com. They, of course, also get their name in the third segment of the show. They get access to our citizen-only hangouts, early access to After Dark, and honestly, even more than that, If again, if you are excited to become a citizen of tomorrow, please head on over to Patreon.com slash TMRO or Makersupport.com slash TMRO. Okay, so last week we had a lovely, lively discussion about the NASA 2019 budget, proposed budget, right? Yes. Uh, if you ain't talking money, I don't want to talk. Right. So, that's right. the way it works. So. <laughs> which, which, you know, uh, strangely, we had no comments for. Really? No, nobody believes me when I say that. Oh, yeah, we had, everyone had lots of things to say. Uh, <laughs> so I just figured, you know, it, there was going to be one, one week where everyone's going to be like, yeah, we're not talking about that now. All right, cool. Uh, but that, that, is not, that is not this week. Uh, we had plenty of people saying all kinds of things. So uh, first up we have uh, from YouTube, one Frank Mueller says, I want NASA to do that which uh, the private market can't or won't. Colonization of space, like those long ago regions of Earth, will never happen until they are economically viable in and of themselves. Creation of such a station would light a fire under planetary resources and deep space industries to get to mining asteroids to fuel uh, for fuel to feed such a station. And once they do, more companies will want such orbital stations for their projects and industries, like pharmaceuticals. And then move into Lagrange points as well. Uh, or two, he says, I suppose. Uh, that's the future. I won't be here to see, but I wish I could be. Um, I'm Frank, I mean, uh, we're all getting older. I'm not going to say that maybe, you know, maybe you're 100 or plus, and so maybe you won't be able to see that. But assuming you're not 100 plus, uh, you very well might, honestly. Um, yeah. I feel like a lot of these companies, such as Planetary Resources and, and uh, uh, Deep Space Industries, uh, I keep saying DSI in my head, uh, I, you know, are probably plodding along just fine, you know, without us and are doing a, kind of a lot yeah. like Blue Origin does, right? Like, does a whole bunch of stuff and then goes, hey, surprise, we did things. Um, you know, I don't know if any of you can necessarily speak to that per se, but I feel like that's coming along much quicker than, than we thought. Mike, I can see you, you've got something you want to say, so go ahead, Sorry. go ahead, jump in. No, 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 it's good. Go I feel like both of those companies already have plenty of motivation and a fire lit under them to accomplish that. I feel like what Frank is talking about, if, if that type of thing would happen, would light a fire under the people who would invest in those companies. Because, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the, the fire is burning bright and burning up all their cash. So Right? Yeah. Right. I kind of agree with Frank um, on the idea that NASA should be doing the things that industry currently isn't doing. Um, I really want NASA to sort of get back to um, sort of the, the fundamentals, the bread and butter, like kind of like almost like the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics did mm. um, early on in, the, in, the, in aviation and other things like that. Um, NACA developed uh, airfoils, cowlings, um, other things that they then handed to industry and said, go nuts, have fun with this. Um, and they were you know, hugely instrumental in, in helping develop aircraft um, into where they are now. And of course, NACA ended up getting turned into NASA, mm -hmm. and, and they still continue to do that, I'll bet, with the, 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 air, the astronautics um, mm -hmm. component involved in it um, there. And it would be really cool to see them get back to that, as opposed to uh, burning large piles of cash on leaning launch towers and stuff like that. So, yeah, 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 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think that um, as far as just the statement alone saying that uh, to have NASA do something that the private market can't or won't, mm -hmm. um, I understand that that, that difference. Um, I think that what's great right now is, is the fact that, like we said, SpaceX and NASA are actually like now partnering together for science missions, mm -hmm. which is huge. So I think that 
for them to work together is something really important because either way, anytime, if say the federal budget's going to be going down in certain regions, it can just now potentially these private markets can actually increase, you know, in their areas or like they'll, they'll just instead put more focus on like the science missions if that's being a decrease in, in NASA and the federal budget and like federal agencies or government agencies. Mm -hmm. So I think it, um, to have, it's kind of like saying keep everyone in their own place, but I, I think that um, maybe for, for certain departments that's, that's good, but I think overall it's still really good to have that overall collaboration because that's what we do worldwide anyway. Mm -hmm. So why would we do it any different versus a government versus like a, a private institution? Um, so that's kind of just my thoughts on that comment. Yeah. 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 Get back to the cutting edge. Yeah. Make it the bleeding edge. The bleeding. Do the cool stuff. <laughs> so, I guess. <laughs> Perfect. I would yeah, say no, it, so. I mean, I, I feel like we yeah. all sort of agree there, so. Let's get now. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, next comment uh, comes off of YouTube as well. Uh, this one is from Christopher. Good, good, solid name that I can pronounce. I appreciate that sometimes. Uh, says, best show ever. Yes, budget for NASA is failing to, uh, to wayside, but little, uh, sorry, is failing to wayside little, but SpaceX stock just increased by 100%. Falcon Heavy is going to be huge. I hope there was a pun intended there. Um, all <laughs> eyes on SpaceX and hopefully Bigelow Airspace are talking and coming up with ideas with inflatable habitation. Athena is a jewel, really intelligent, and pretty fantastic addition to tomorrow's space team. Thank you. And we miss you here in Minnesota. Hoping guys, I hope to run into you guys someday. It would be huge for me, at least. Aw, thank you. Oh. Aw, that was such a nice comment. Aww. <laughs> Aww. Praise. Uh, praise. 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 Oh, no. Praise. Yeah, no, uh, yes, uh, I totally agree. Athena is a great addition uh, to the show. Uh, again, Thanks. primarily from science, but you know, hanging out here with us on space because yeah, those, why not? Uh, those, Good uh, space is yeah, right? Space is science. Science is space. Same exactly. Thing, but, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, wait, 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 that's a bunch of. <laughs> wait, I have to reread the comment now. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Falcon Heavy is going to be really huge. I think that that's going to be really good. And I think uh, I was hearing about this about stock increasing. And um, well, we don't have to get into cryptocurrency, but uh, yeah. a, a lot was uh, increasing with that also, which is pretty pretty cool. But I think uh, I think it's still really important, obviously, to have that strong foundation of NASA, just because SpaceX, obviously, it's becoming so much more broader, where a lot of people are becoming familiar with the name, especially after you know with, with uh, obviously the last launch, but sure. the, the Falcon yeah. Heavy launch. But I think that's still having that yeah the, the nasa name is is huge yeah um, with the country yeah i feel like we're not quite at that point like uh like alan stern was talking about with the, the hudson bay company and other groups uh, during that time period that right. we're actually doing exploration in addition to colonization as private enterprise um i don't feel like we're at that point yet mm -hmm. uh, but i feel like we will eventually get to that point so for now nasa is super important in that it it does concentrate especially on you know, robotic missions and astrophysics and, and planetary sciences on stuff that private companies really aren't particularly interested in at the moment. Mm -hmm. Now, like deep space industries mm -hmm. and other groups, oh yeah, they're definitely trying to get as much asteroid data as they can. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if um, if we see like a private asteroid observation mission mm -hmm. um, come mm -hmm. up in the next five years, which would be great would be because so not only would those companies get the data, hopefully the companies would be willing to send that data to NASA as well. And then everybody kind of wins. And that's kind of one of yeah. the really nice things about private-public partnerships is that, you know, everybody kind of wins with that. The company gets what they need out of it, and then the civil side of that also gets what they need out of it as well. So there's really no, like, losers in a public-private partnership mm -hmm. um, in terms of space exploration. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Uh, as Chris Radcliffe in the chat room says, uh, space is everything, as we heard earlier. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Good loop back. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, next comment also comes off of YouTube from one generic fake name. Um, we're just going to go with that. Uh, it says, I have a good feeling that the future of space will be great with private companies getting more involved. SpaceX made a test launch of a beefy cargo ship as exciting as the first humans to walk on the moon. NASA's infamous for making things boring and a lack of public interest killed NASA's Mars plans in the 70s. I think the private industry might solve the pub the solve the public relations problem the space industry has had up until now. Um, uh, I think we uh, sort of linked about it or talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, space is boring. And to a certain extent, uh, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, for those of you who have been watching the show for quite a while, uh, if you go back to season three, episode eight, I found out, uh, we were, we, we interviewed a really lovely human being, Andy, uh, 
uh, Cochran, and uh, he did at the very first space up in San Diego. He did this what we did a T minus five talk, sort of a just a quick talk, and his was labeled "Space is Boring." And uh, going into again, sort of seeing the title and making a judgment call, I, seeing that title, I was like, "Who is this guy? And what is he talking about?" And I don't understand because I love space, and everyone should too. And what, how dare you say space is boring? Okay. And uh, but he he made a lovely point that was extremely. Uh, poignant, for lack of a better word. Uh, he put some astronauts up on screen, and he said, I bet these people have names! And I realized, yeah, yeah I know, like, that one, and I know this person, and I don't know all of them, and why mm -hmm. don't I know all of them? And yeah. all of that sort of thing. Um, so I, I don't know that uh, space necessarily has a public relations... I don't, I don't know that NASA has to have that kind of public relations part of it. I love it. I love the NASA socials. I love the mm -hmm. NASA tweet ups yeah. as they were back in the day. Um, thank you, Chris Radcliffe, for, for putting better. that in the chat room. Um, <laughs> I feel and, like, and I feel like they're getting better, but I don't feel like they need they need to have it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I feel like science in general has a PR problem. Yeah, yeah. There's a huge, huge gap between interaction of scientists and public, and that's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. In not just the spaceflight industry, but everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I mean, we could do like an entire, t we might even do a Tomorrow Science show. Yeah, we um, might do an entire that. show about it, you guys. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah. so maybe that's a future topic that we can talk about. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, so there's just, just, we really need to step up the game. And I feel like we'll talk about that on the eventual Tomorrow Science episode about there you that, go. I suppose. Yeah. So. I yeah. think, uh, Athena, you were perfectly suited to, to speak to that, I, I suppose. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, for me, I feel like it all stems from childhood, and I think that that's where it starts, and then it just sort of evolves from there, and it's with especially the science PR, what you were saying, like, that that needs to be better. You look at childhood, and, it, you know, you're in school, and it, that's where the, the, I guess, the diversion begins mm -hmm. of, like, you mm -hmm. know, where you're going to be going for the next 10 years um, as far as, like, your interests and stuff. And very few people, I think, will actually explore multiple realms, but a lot of times you tend to be put into one, whatever your parents are doing, what your friends are doing, whatever it is. And I think that just through repeated history, we tend to... Um, like kind of keep each of those subcategories to themselves. And so with, with, you know, those that are really good at marketing and they're really good at business, they go into business marketing for products, you know, that are, that are different. But those mm -hmm. are really good at science, really good at space. They see the, the bigger picture of science and space. They're not so worried about the whole marketing side. They're mm -hmm. not, so, And I think that that's why what we're doing is important, why a lot of other people are doing is important, which is actually doing the outreach because it is bringing like what everything is around us to actually making people realize just how important it is. And like I said, I think that it, that's why I'm so happy about you know the fact that there are so many STEM programs that I'm really hoping is going to um, not be canceled mm -hmm. in the proposed budget, um, and I hope it actually will go forward because that's where it stems. That's where the root is. Mm -hmm. You know, like we can all you know be happy and dandy and be like you know adults and talking about um, w wanting to actually pursue science, and a lot of us who are doing it, and that's great. And we're making big differences, but the ones that are really going to uh, cause a huge shift in humanity are going to be the young ones to actually say, "Wow, I know that person, that person, that person, this astronaut, this astronaut," and say, "Okay." Now, what do I do? How do I get into this? Yeah. So, yeah, like I never really saw like ads for like, um, what was it, the, the science fairs in school. I saw ads for the cheerleading squad. Well, actually, I didn't, my school I didn't have a cheerleading squad, but like generic school sure. <laughs> did. Where they had, they had auditions for those things. There was ads everywhere about like, oh, being, being this class president. Right. But there wasn't a lot about like the science club and all these other things. I didn't even know yeah. about these. Yeah. I didn't even know my high school had a planetarium until I actually started going to the school. They didn't advertise that in the in the, in the high school book. Right, they didn't right. say, "Oh, Edward R. Murrow has a planetarium." No, they didn't say that. It said like, "Oh, you know, department, all these other things, which sure. is cool." But it, they don't advertise. I think a lot of these things, um, unless it's like a high end tech school. But so yeah, yeah kills tangent. <laughs> no, that's no, good. it's no, good. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. I feel like uh, yeah, I add on to that a little bit too. Yeah. Um, I feel like NASA, with the whole education office, is really good about reaching out to elementary schools and inspiring elementary kids and stuff like that. I'm sure we all kind of have similar stories of mm -hmm. getting inspired about space and then eventually falling out of it. I wish that they would continue that same sort of outreach that they do with elementary schools in middle school and in high school and even in college. And yes, they have all these scholarships and stuff like that. And you you know, the whole budget that we talked about last week, you know, we'll decide whether or not that will continue in the next year or not. But, you know, I wish that it continued. You know, yes, it's great. We got to inspire the younger generation, but we got to keep them inspired, too, because. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I feel like overall uh, education kind of needs uh, an update. 
because the last major overhaul in education happened in the 17th century. So mm. we're kind of running on a very old system, and <laughs> yeah. I feel like we kind of need to update some things. Um, and in addition to that, I feel like, especially in STEM, there's a huge sort of uh, 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 casting asunder of arts and humanities that, that is, is very disadvantageous mm -hmm. to the people going through STEM. You know, it's always like, um, it's always, there's, I, I always see people on Twitter uh, dunking on arts majors. And yeah. it's like, that's not really a great way to do it because these same people will also lament, oh my gosh, what happened to our critical thinking skills? I'm like, hmm, what does arts and humanities teach you? Yeah. Um, sure, science teaches you that too, but arts and humanities teaches it um, from different perspectives and that really helps out. So. Um, so I feel like there, there's, especially in a communication aspect, arts and humanities really meshes well with science in terms of uh, out communication and outreach. And that's really, to me, what's, what's missing besides redo education from the foundation up and, and get it you know, back together um, because a 17th century system doesn't work well in the 21st century. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we're not putting leeches on people and, and <laughs> yeah. trying to blood let them out when they get <laughs> yeah. the flu. Um, I don't know, we might be uh, in certain places, uh, but, oh my gosh, um, but most of the time we're not. We're yeah. getting the flu shot and then staying at home and having chicken noodle soup and Gatorade. So, you know, <laughs> so let's, 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 let's kind of update it a little bit. Let's also not forget art because it's important. Yeah. It really is. It comes from having so. to be pushed into a decision making at a young age. I mm -hmm. think that's a huge thing. It's like, yeah. oh, okay, well, what do you want to do? Well, I, uh, I work in a business, so you got to do that too, son. And I think that that's, yeah. And there's a big decision making being pushed on kids at a really young age, um, unless you go to an art school. Yeah. So. I will say that uh, if you're interested in maybe getting a little bit involved, uh, besides watching the show, which is fantastic and doing mm -hmm. that, uh, Miss Athena does have an amazing uh, space pod coming out a little bit later on this week uh, where she speaks with, oh, well, I'll let her go into that, but uh, she does talk a little bit about Yuri's Night and a little bit of the Expanse and how all of those things come together. So yes. look out for that a little bit later on this week. So the next comment also comes out. Oh, no, not also. And this one comes off of Reddit. See, we check all of the places you comment. This one comes from Casey Hoosier. <laughs> Hoosier uh, says, this proposal is in fight is insightful as it shows what NASA and the President Trump want. But committee meetings, Senate proposals, House proposals, committee votes, budget negotiations, constituent feedback, PAC donations, and then final votes happen, and the final budget may be tweaked or it may be completely changed. U.S. <laughs> government budget proposals are so nebulous and frustrating. Oh, aren't they? Nebulous. Though? Yeah, nebulous is such a <laughs> nebulous. perfect word for that. Nebulous. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is difficult. Especially, I would imagine, especially if you're outside of the United States, looking at how uh, the government sometimes works in the United yeah. States. It's just like, huh? So you know. <laughs> how did, how did you, uh, okay. So you know. Yeah. <laughs> it is interesting to follow the sometimes though, and seeing the counter offers that go back and forth between the House yeah. and the Senate, and, mm -hmm. and the different subcommittees, and all that sort of stuff, and what the final uh, compromise eventually is. And you know, a lot of stuff like I remember even just the year before. Trump wanted to also cancel the education office then, and the Senate and the House fought and were just like, uh, no, we might lower the budget a little bit for that, but that, that needs to stay. So, you know, any time that there's a proposal like this, especially from the executive office that kills a program that we might really like, it's never the end of it. It's there's yeah. always going to be a back and forth, so. Yeah. 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 So we'll see. It's going to go for a while, I think. Uh, yeah. well, until I when is I think there there is a deadline soon, but that's usually like I said like the blitz is happening next week. Is there did you know the deadline? Oh. Um that, that's like <laughs> Have we punishment. actually officially come up with the budget for this year that was supposed to be decided last October? Aren't we still like trying to figure this that out? Still... Are we on another continuing resolution? <laughs> I think yeah. the continuing resolutions will continue <laughs> until there is a resolution. It's, uh, so it's a mighty fine point there. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, <laughs> also, really quickly, Mike, I want to point out thank you for wearing a color as uh, the rest of us apparently did not get that memo this week. Well, space so, is the oh, new I didn't black. So. That. So then, uh, <laughs> space is the new <laughs> black. I do black, but you know. The right. background, you'd be a floating head. No, the, the yeah. blue is lovely on you. Exactly. Well, in terms of uh, energy output and color temperature, Mike is winning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. Oh, so good. All right. The final comment this week uh, comes off of YouTube from one James E. Wagner Jr. says, if a day on Mars is 24 hours and 40 minutes, you get to sleep an extra 40 minutes a day. 
That's or, so something to look forward to. <laughs> right? I'm on board with this. And you know what's so cool about that um, is that the, the teams that operate out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in Pasadena, uh -huh. um, uh, uh, Johnson Space Center's medical teams will actually hook them up, they'll wire them up with sensors all over them to measure everything you can think of biologically mm -hmm. during those early months of the mission to, because they don't run on Earth time. The sure. people, who, the engineers and scientists, they actually run on Mars time. Mm -hmm. So they go into work 40 minutes later every day for the first couple of months That's of so the mission cool. and they wire it up and they see, you know, who can handle uh, that extra 40 minutes, who doesn't do so good with it. And it turns out people who are night owls do really great with wow. it, that extra 40 minutes. But people who are like early morning risers, it just ruins their lives for for several what? months. So I'm really looking forward to Mars because I'm an I'm a hardcore night owl. So like <laughs> this is going to be great. I can't wait. So but overall it does kind of ruin your body clock because it takes uh, they found it takes longer than those several months to actually get your your body clock synced up with Mars. Yeah, so, I'm sure yeah, it does. It's it's some wild stuff. So <laughs> That's crazy. I don't know how I'd react. I was thinking, I was like, oh, extra 40 minutes to work. And then I was like, wait, okay. <laughs> but I guess you just spend that time sleeping. Yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Lisa Stojanowski uh, in our <laughs> chat room, off of YouTube chat room, says, can you confirm I did not get extra sleep? Um, I just feel like maybe you were just doing it wrong, Lisa. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Lisa is also one of our co-hosts on our Tomorrow Science channel and uh, has done many a stint here on the Tomorrow Space channel. So, uh, But uh, that's good. Good to know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an early bird, so apparently I'm, I'm right out. Same. Yes. I don't think it would work right for me. Good to know. Good to know. All right, so that's basically our show. I do want to make sure I give a thank you again to our citizen ground support uh, people. People. These people will give us a dollar or more per episode on Patreon or a dollar per month or more on Makersupport.com. They also get their name in the show. You get access to exclusive citizen-only hangouts and early access to After Dark as soon as it's available on demand. And we appreciate every single one of you. So thank you for that. Uh, next week, uh, we looks like we are going to have uh, Max Hout, Max Hot. I don't know how to pronounce that. I probably should have asked before I said it out loud. Who is the founder and CEO of Launcher? So that's that's really cool. That sounds like that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then anybody, we're good, right? We're good. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. We're good. Just yeah. That was good. Looking awesome. Forward, I'm looking forward to Yuri's good night. So. Oh, so excited. Gonna be, Can you I'm, put sparkles in your mohawk? Oh, please, oh, please, yes. please. Oh, yes. wow. So I know we're going to be talking about it after dark. Hopefully, if you are joining us live, you will get to hear the end of that conversation. <laughs> yes. And if not, it's going to be a little bit longer for you. But thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.